Welcome to the Self-Publishing Experience, the quarterly podcast about indie publishing from the team of Troubadour Publishing. Here are your hosts, Stephanie Carr and Jeremy Thompson. Welcome to the seventh episode of the Self-Publishing Experience podcast, where the team at Troubadour bring together industry insights, author conversations, and tips and tricks designed to help out anyone interested in self-publishing. In this episode, we'll be looking at marketing. We'll speak to Matador authors Angela Dyson on how she gets so many book signings, Griselda Heppel on what she'll be doing to promote her new book, GK Holloway about signing at local events, And then we speak to Anna Burt from Jericho Writers on how they can help aspiring authors. Book marketing is the one area of self-publishing that we get asked about all the time, as it can be such a complex area. There's marketing to the book trade so that bookshops and retailers know the book exists. There's the buzz that you need to create before publication and the press and review marketing that you'll need to do as the book becomes available. We'll cover some handy tips for all of these in this podcast, but first let's hear from Sophie Morgan, a marketing controller here at Matador, who helps authors market their books. Sophie gives some great tips on how authors can start to tackle book marketing. Contrary to popular belief, marketing isn't something you should start thinking about once the book is published. It should be something you've considered whilst writing and submitting the book for publication. I get a lot of authors saying to me that they haven't considered who their readers are, what they'd like to achieve with the book, or really anything past holding the book in their hands. That's an exciting moment, it's true, but this is when the real work begins. If you've opted for marketing services with Matador, the marketing team are here to help and give you the tools to help you succeed. However, whilst we can give you the benefit of advice and experience, it is vital that an author also look to how they can maximise marketing potential themselves. This can be very small to very large and anything in between, But the important thing is to get yourself and the book out there. While we can run a press campaign, this relationship depends on both parties doing their bit. And even mainstream authors are expected to promote their book themselves. Nobody can hide behind their screens anymore. Most authors I speak to hate selling themselves, which is how they see selling their book. And they're not far wrong. At the end of the day, you are the book's voice. And you need to make noise to get people to look your way with so much competition out there. Nobody has the passion for this project as much as you, and sometimes this goes further with the press or bookshops than any emails from professionals can. So how to do this? Well, for starters, think local. Local will usually support local, so reach out and emphasise your local connections. Try and build relationships and show that passion. It will help you to sell the book to them much more than any dry sales pitch. The other main thing is visibility, so try and think outside the box about what will get eyes on the book. Create some marketing materials, so bookmarks, leaflets, business cards, even beer mats, pens, wrapping paper, Christmas cards. Really go for it. And then give them out. Pin them to notice boards. Set up a stall at a car boot and try and sell. One author of mine published a book about cows roaming the town and created a life-size papier-mâché cow to parade the streets of her local town with copies of the book and then gave people the opportunity to take a photo with him. This is true outside the box thinking, and I do believe it actually worked to some degree. So really do think outside the box and try and engage with readers. Sometimes the best way an author can promote their book isn't by going out, but also by staying in and online and reaching a wider audience by using social media to engage. The idea of social media is not to be a salesman, but to create new contacts, be sociable and talk to other readers and make connections that may help you promote the book, review the book, or even buy the book themselves. Promoting a book takes energy and thought, but what you put in is what you get out. We're here to help, offer advice, run ideas past, but at the end of the day, you are what will drive the book to sell. Being friendly and funny and personable will net more sales for a debut than if you hide at home and just hope that people find the book. Your creativity drove you to write the book. You just need to use that creativity to think how to reach readers now. Some interesting points there, especially in terms of networking and having a good idea about the audience for the book before approaching the publishing process. Exactly. And don't forget that marketing an ebook can be a really different process from marketing your physical book. Predominantly, ebooks are sold online, so online is where the marketing takes place. 
So whereas with physical book marketing, you might be looking at getting coverage in magazines or being featured on, on the radio, with ebooks, what you're really looking for is generating consumer reviews on sites like Amazon or Goodreads. You know, you may not think that one Amazon review is going to make much of a difference, but in our experience, it's reviews like that that really help to drive ebook sales. And unlike an ebook, of course, many authors enjoy having launches or book signings. Angela Dyson, author of the Love Detective series, has held over 50 such events at Waterstones. With your first book, how did you go about marketing and getting people to know what your title is all about? Well, I'm a, a complete newbie to, to the whole industry and I have no background or experience in marketing at all. But what I wanted to do was to get my book into Waterstones. That was my absolute driving force. And that is not easy to do, I have to say. I made a very concerted effort to be extremely human about it. Um, I think what, what happens a lot is Waterstones staff get approached and head office get approached by authors all the time. And authors can be a little bit aggressive. You know, you've got to sell my book. It's the best book in the world. Well, they've got millions of books to sell. So I worked on it on a store by store basis. And I started with my hometown store uh, in Surrey. And I was lucky enough to be allowed to do my launch there, which was for book number one, which was absolutely fantastic. And I made bloody sure that that launch was absolutely chock-a-block. I mean, I even, I got all my friends and family, obviously, but I canvassed in the town. So we had a real sellout night of about 45 people. And I made sure that it wasn't a sort of warm wine in a plastic beaker affair, because I don't care for that, darling. You've got to have a bit of style about these things. So I had um, I had lots of ice cold Prosecco. We had some lovely canapes. Um, I got flowers all arranged. So it looked absolutely beautiful. And, and that really was the start. From there, I contacted, I have a... Um, a document in my PC of every single Waterstones in the country and I can honestly tell you that I have contacted about 95% of them personally and repeatedly. Now some of them are simply not interested at all but slowly but surely I managed to get book one. I think we got up to about 150 of the branches and that was purely by phoning people. The simple things, making a note of who you've spoken to, if they give you any kind of personal in information, make a note of it. So you can say, oh, how did your house move go? Or, oh, crikey, you were, you were worried about the kids being on holiday. That sort of thing. Treating people like human beings. Then what I managed to do was get lots of signings. Just before the lockdown, I had my 50th uh, Waterstones book signing event. How did you get your book, your book signings? What do you do? Do you just... Did you go, do you go in and speak to the people directly? Do you take copies of the um, books? Well, what was, what was um, yes, they, they um, order the books from, from you, from Chubidor, Um, But it's, it's not easy to get those signings. But I made sure that every single signing I did, I sold out. Now, that means you practically have to sell your soul. And you cannot be shy. I made that decision um, that I was going to sell it, it strikes me that you can have the best product in the world, the best idea in the world, the best service in the world. But if you can't bloody well sell it, there's no point in having it. So I'd heard from various members of staff in these shops. And I was always very chatty, made an, as I say, made a note of everybody's names. Um, that a lot of authors that do eventually, and I'm not talking the big time authors, but you know, middle, middle and, and lower level authors like me, who they would just go and they'd sit down, they'd look at their phone, they'd expect people to come over. No, 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 no. Never sit down, stand up, be charming, talk to people, engage with people, say hi. I'm whoever you are, I'm Angela. I'm signing copies of my book here today. I may I tell you about it? Some people will say, no, not interested. But mostly people are lovely. And I made and so I sold out every single time. With your your book signings and, and, and when it went incredibly well and you sold out, did those branches then stock your book moving forwards? Absolutely, yes. And of course, what happens is I hadn't quite realised it, but I got a bit of a, rep a very nice reputation. So I started getting emails from other branches saying, oh, you know, I, I heard you did fantastically in Weybridge or you did brilliantly in Camberley or wherever. We'd love to have you here. So that was a real joy. And, and I think it's, it was two things. It was about engaging with the staff 
um, and being, you know, being on their side, not expect, they don't want anybody high maintenance. Their life in retail, and if anybody's ever worked in retail, I certainly have, it's a tough gig out there. And the general public can drive you bloody mad. So, so having an author who sort of expects the staff to kind of look after them is, is no good. You just, I would basically say, I'm low maintenance, provide the books, give me a little table, put me at the front of the shop somewhere, I'm good to go. Also, I have a, a social media presence. Now, that is really foreign to me. I'm a real, I was a real dinosaur on that. But I employ um, a lady, uh, a marketing guru lady, um, who set me up on Twitter and Facebook. And we do, I have a lovely website and I do blogs. I found that at the beginning very difficult. You, you, and I don't do it properly at the moment. You're meant to tweet to have any sort of pro, um, profile four times a day. Good Lord, you'd never get anything else done as far as I can see. But just, you know, I, I, I didn't do everything. I haven't done Instagram. I haven't done some of the others. I was advised very early on, don't try and do everything. Just do one or two fairly decently. Do you know when, when the second one came out, did you find that it was almost easier to market because you've already made those connections with the people, yes. like for instance, in Waterstones. Yes, absolutely. And the, the, every single branch that I've been in has said, well, well, a lot of branches I've gone repeatedly back to every three months, they've had me back again, even for when I just had the first book. Um, because, you know, they're, unless it's a tiny town, they've got lots of customers. I like um, when, when the second book came out, when we were sending your printed book out to reviewers and the people who requested it, Sophie wrapped them up in pink tissue paper with little like Love Heart Sweets and something. I think that was a nice little addition and it made people remember your book, maybe give them more like more inclination to, to read it and review it. Yes, I was absolutely delighted with that. I thought it was an absolutely lovely idea. I thought what was interesting about that was I saw it on Twitter. A lot of reviewers, when they received the book, they tweeted a photo of it and tagged us in it. And I just thought, well, that's good. That's what you want. You want somebody to just take that extra five minutes to take a photo and post it. There's some free publicity for you. It just, well, exactly. And yeah. that's the thing, you know, I mean, we can, I think it's difficult sometimes for, for authors because you get so involved in writing the book, you forget and don't necessarily recognize the importance of everything else that comes around it. And where, with book one, when I was sending out the AI, I, I had a list of every independent bookshop, not just Waterstones ones, but independent bookshops. And I sold, I sent out several hundred of them. And I thought, well, what can I put in the envelope that's not too expensive, not too heavy, not gonna get chucked away? I came across in Tesco Superstore, a little palais mat, you know, for a coffee cup that has had a heart on it. So I bought tons of them and I sent one out with every single um, AI. Why not? You've got nothing to lose. You know, give it your best shot. I think that's the thing. And don't be too timid, I would say, to any other author that's starting out. You know, just be brave. What have we got to lose? Events like this, if you can persuade your local bookshop, can be really rewarding and offer a great opportunity for sales. But bookshops are not the only avenue to go down, as Andrea Johnson found out when she talked to G.K. Holloway, author of 1066, who sells his book at local history festivals. So we've caught you in the office now. You've come to pick up some books mm -hmm. on the way to do an event this weekend. What's the event that you're doing? The event is the Midlands History Festival at Northampton. And they're doing various periods, but they've got a Viking and Saxon uh, event. Um, so I'm going along there, hoping to sell my book to people who are interested in that time period. Do you do many events like that? I do, I do a few historical ones and I've done a few literary festivals. What do you think to those? If you go to sell a lot of books and hopefully get a lot of money and be famous, you're <laughs> going to be disappointed. Um, I've been to literary festivals and not sold anything at all but then I've met a lot of people a, a lot of uh, writers some publishers and one or two other people in the business and it's been worthwhile from a networking point of view if you like and a social point of view well you can be and you can feel quite isolated as a writer so to meet other writers and have a chat 
and pick up tips and advice uh, it's just great you feel like you've made contact and you're not just out there on your own having said that selling a paperback is different from selling an ebook so I believe uh, and as far as if you sell somebody an ebook that person will read the ebook and might tell their friends oh it's good and might recommend it then they may or may not buy it with a paperback somebody will buy it they'll lend it to people and I forget what the, the, the actual figure is but for every paperback that's that's printed about 15 20 people read it so it does get you you out there and over time you can build up a reputation but I, I, I stick to this at the uh, the history festivals more than anything now do you enjoy doing those I enjoy doing that because uh, a, I, I meet more people um, I've got a regular f uh, festival that I go to in Staffordshire the Abbots Bromley Horn Dance and it's every September so you get people from all over the world there I've spoken to people from Zimbabwe Australia Americans Canadians all sorts of people and they're all there just to, to see this dance so they're all interested in history and it's that particular time period and so people will come along have a chat and then buy the book and I did Stanford Bridge at the uh, at the 950th anniversary there were a lot of authors went up there um, and that was a great day because people came over from Iceland and Norway and well everywhere so that was good and got to make you meet loads of people and know lots about it and sometimes you'll meet people who come up and tell you things that aren't in the history books you know because they've got local knowledge people who've been born in Stamford Bridge or born in battle um, and, and have done, done a lot of research and they know the area really well yeah so the history festivals work well I've done a couple of um, well I've done about half a dozen radio interviews mm. as well and they're worth doing because you notice little peaks in, in sales afterwards with BBC I've had a couple of half hour interviews and with, with local Bristol radio I've been part of an hour long programme and, and, and a radio station in Somerset as well so they're, they're pretty good to do What Andrew and GK Holloway have in common is that they enjoy meeting people and talking about their books so I suppose networking is a key skill that authors need to develop as part of their marketing of their work and for many authors of course that's the hardest part Exactly, and our next interview is with Griselda Heppel, who is publishing her third book with Matador, and she understands that she can't just sit back and expect the book to sell, she has to make the effort. I'm Griselda Heppel, and I write uh, for children between the ages of about nine and 13, and I've published two books with Matador. Uh, the first was Anti's Inferno, which was, it was very exciting doing that because it won a couple of awards, including the People's Book Prize. Then my second book was called The Tragical History of Henry Faust. And now I am bringing out my third book. It's called The Fall of the Sparrow. So are the three titles linked at all or are they three separate titles? They're three separate titles. What links them um, is the cover design, in fact, because I've got this wonderful wood engraver, Hilary Painter. But no, they are not sequels to each other. Somehow I don't think in that way. I may, I may do one day, um, but I tend to, when I finish one book, I start uh, thinking about characters for another book. You mentioned that, well, you, you've indicated there, so you're having your own cover design done, you, we're not doing that for you. Um, was that always a conscious decision? Was it that you would outsource that to somebody else? Yes, um, that was something I wanted to do right from the start. Um, I'm a great fan of wood engravings and Hilary Painter is, is a, a wonderful artist and I knew what I wanted on the cover and what I wanted it, how I wanted it to look and so I commissioned her to do the covers or to do the engravings and then um, my designer Pete Lawrence turned them into uh, really lovely book covers and I'm particularly excited by this one I think it's it's one of the best but I would say that wouldn't I <laughs> <laughs> no, if it works for your title though I, I think that makes sense because you do want a cover which reflects the work and which is something which is individual to your work so it does make sense that you've used the same theme and the same designer that we say all the way through when 
well, you, you decided to publish your third title. When deciding what services to go for and what direction you wanted to go for, what experiences did you take from the publications of the previous two? There wasn't a lot of difference. In the actual services I require from Matador for this title, they're pretty much the same uh, because I very much like the way Matador uh, works with their authors, um, with the design of the book, the, the feel of it, the look of it, that's all terribly important to me as well as the content. I, you know, I, I, I don't want something that I've put so much hard work and love into not to, not to look good at the end, it's, it's, uh, it's important. And I think Matador do that really well. The one difference this time is in the decision I've made just to publish hardback. For the last two titles, I published hardback and paperback at the same time, which has a sort of financial um, aspect to it. It is obviously more if you do, do both, more expensive. I thought this time I would just start with the hardback and then that gives me scope to bring out a paperback later if I want to. And then you have the benefit of, of having another sort of something exciting that's happening, you know, a renewed interest, which is, of course, what happens in the commercial world of books as well. I suppose as well, it leads another um, route into marketing as well, because if you're marketing the hardback now, you can focus your, en focus your energy on that. But come when you do decide to do the paperback you have another you can give it another boost can't you is, is, yes, that, exactly. is that the plan is that the plan to do that um that would it, that would be the plan that gives me the option you know I can do it anytime after all in regards to marketing the title will you be d doing any of your own marketing any of your own publicity out there for the title yes uh, I mean and, and I think this is where you have to be realistic. Um, I guess working in publicity myself um, made me realise that. It's, it'll be very good having Matador's marketing services. We're working on a press release at the moment and Matador will have a good idea of people to send it out to who, who might be interested in running reviews, um, seeing copies. You know, that's useful. Then I have my own people that I would want to contact again if they... Um, sort of local papers and children's magazines, the librarian if possible, that's a really good thing to get into if you can. People who might have been interested in my books before, I would try them again. I think with marketing, the author is, is really the best um, champion of the book. And it's, it's, it's actually just a question of putting in the effort. I, I think if I sat back and just expected it all to happen, uh, I'd be disappointed and it and I know it doesn't work that way you know I'll be contacting people I think might be interested in reviewing it writing about it on on my website and I've got a Facebook page Griselda Heppel Griselda Heppel at Twitter on I've got a blog on WordPress and and I'd be sort of keeping keeping the, the, the thing bubbling away there and you know, emailing people, um, not indiscriminately, that's really important. You can't just annoy people. But again, it's all a question of the ones you know would be interested. And ultimately, when I've got copies of the book, I've always found actually the best way of getting to the readers is arranging school visits. And I love doing that. That, of course, has been sort of all thrown into the air because of the pandemic. And um, this has been really very difficult for children's authors who just haven't been able to do what they normally do with workshops and, and author visits. Did you go into a lot of schools then for your previous titles? Yes, quite, quite a few. I certainly went as many schools as I could locally. Further afield, not so many, because it's, it's a question of them just getting to know you, really. It's, schools are so busy, the teachers are so busy. If they have no idea um, about you, then it's a much harder mountain to climb for you to visit. But um, I found with the ones that have had me, then they know that actually the children get a lot out of it. It's, uh, I do a, a, a talk designed on the background of each book and I make the, the children help me with it and ask them questions. It's amazing how, how much they know and they didn't know they knew and then that gets them excited about it and, and um, yes it's wonderful and for an author to have that communication with with your readers and particularly that age which I, which I love because that you know obviously I love it that's the age I write for it's really inspiring and exciting yes. 
obviously you've published two books already. You've, you've got a third in progress. If you mm -hmm. were asked three pieces of advice to give to somebody who's not published anything before, they're considering going down the self-published route, in your experience, what would you say the three most important things? Well, I think top of that is that your book has got to be as good as it possibly can be. And it won't be on the first draft or the second or maybe several drafts on after that. So you need to rewrite. You know, it's one of the hardest things actually to get the story done. That is so hard because you're creating it from nothing. Once you've got it there, that's a fantastic achievement. Leave it for a few weeks if you can, a couple of weeks at least. Look at it again and you'll see all kinds of things that are wrong with it. So, so lots of rewriting. And then I, I would recommend, if you can, getting somebody you trust to give you a straight but not too harsh opinion to look at it. I've used literary consultants. It's really hard because, you know, they are professionals and they are going to say, well, actually, the structure completely doesn't work. You know, you've story's a good idea, but, you know, you've got to redo. And that's, that is very hard. Uh, but it does make for a better book in the end. And I think it's so important if you're self-publishing, you don't want to skimp on any of the quality of your work and what you're producing, um, because it's up to you to make sure it isn't like that. I like the fact you use um, literary consultants as well. So is that something that you would always advise maybe going to a professional rather than a friend or family member? I would. Family members, um, it, they are useful. Uh, my first readers of Andy's Inferno were my children because they were young enough. And what was great about that was that this was mum. If they're going to, they would have said, oh, this is really awful, this book, and it's so embarrassing, and please stop. But they didn't. They really loved it. But anyway, they gave me the first confidence that actually what I thought would be fun to read was fun to read. But I, I think they can't give you that sort of tough professional criticism, the, the tough professional view that somebody not connected you with you will give. Don't skimp on extra things like copy editing. We, we all, well, it's easy to think, you've been through this book so many times, it must be fine. You always need another eye. I've just had my book copy edited through Matador and all sorts of things have, you know, have been noticed that are inconsistent. And this is brilliant because, it, you know, that's exactly what I'm, I'm looking for. And I think the last bit of advice actually is, is perhaps a bit the other way around, which is writing is really hard and it actually gets harder um, as you do it because you, as you learn how to do it, you know more and more the pitfalls. It has got to be exciting and wonderful as well. And if it isn't, and if you are really not enjoying it, then you should give yourself a break, you know, just leave it for a while, for a long while, because it's so tough. It's only something to keep doing if, if it's giving you enough. You can learn about Griselda and her books on her website, uh, griseldaheppel.com. Her latest, The Fall of the Sparrow, has just been published. At the start of this podcast, we talked about how authors should bear in mind the target audience of their book all the way through, from writing to publishing. Earlier this year, Andrea Johnson spoke to Anna Burt, head of events at Jericho Writers, who talks about how they can help new authors in the early stages of their project. Jericho as a, as a company offers quite a lot of courses for, yeah. for new aspiring authors. It just gives a bit of idea of what kind of courses you offer. Oh, well, we offer loads and they're all available on the website, but um, we run a self-edit course, an ultimate novel writing course, which kind of resembles an MA in creative writing. But the um, but you end up, you know, you start the year with no book and you end with a full book basically, um, which is really, really popular. We had to actually extend it this year because we were completely oversubscribed. Um, we have masterclasses with quite well-known authors. We're planning some really exciting ones at the moment. But what we have as well um, are some of the best editors that you can possibly work with that we can set authors up with when they come to us like I'd love a structure led it by someone who's an expert in dystopian sci-fi or I, I really need a um, copy edit by someone who's very good at historical fiction that kind of stuff and we have such a good group of um, editors that we work with we can always um, we can always support anyone that comes to us any writer so would you say the, the support I mean I mean support is support at the end of the day whether an author is looking to submit traditionally or through this self-published route, do you have authors coming to you who are looking to kind of go for both options? 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, whether or not you self-publish or traditionally publish, you need a good book. You know, if you want to self-publish well, it needs to be um, structurally edited. It needs to be copy edited. It needs to be typeset. It needs to be proofread. I mean, this is something that, you know, I can talk more about. And the reason that self-publishing has stigma is because people often do it badly. Um, and so the best, you know, it always, I always say, it always comes down to the book. The book has to be as good as you can possibly make it, especially if you self-publish because you have that extra hoop to jump through. So in my opinion, I think, you know, whether or not you're uh, getting ready to submit to agents or getting ready to upload a book onto KDP, it needs to be the absolute best it can, it can be. And you cannot do that yourself. No one can. You know, the biggest, best names in, you know, the most successful authors, um, you know, that it's not a one person show. Um, and I think that's something that um, that I think really people need to consider when they're self-publishing. It's just like, it's not a one, you know, you cannot be everything. No one is that, you know, you can't be a copy editor, a proofreader, a typesetter, a cover designer, a marketer, an SEO specialist, like you need help and guidance. And um, we have a load of really great self-publishing resources um, in the members and the non-member section on Jericho. I'd really encourage looking at them. Um, and Harry Bingham, I think there's a three hour self-publishing course on there by Harry, who's our, um, who's our chairman. You touched slightly on submitting to agents there. Um, I know you offer an agent submission review pack. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what it what it in, like, covers? Yeah, definitely. So um, the agent submission review pack can be downloaded from Jericho website, but also um, we offer a service to all of our members. And I can't remember if it's non-members or not, so you have to check on the website that you can send us your um, agent submission pack and we can review it for you. And that's just something that we have the expertise to do. So it'll be like, you know, your synopsis isn't right, or this is too long, or you forgot this in your covering letter, or have you thought about maybe trying this or that? And um, what we also have um, available to members only is an agent match service where um, you can basically type in what you like, like in the search engine in itself, what, you, what you're hoping to submit. And then all the agents in whatever territory that you've ticked the box of that look for that genre or accepting um, that genre or that type of book will come up. And then you've got a list there of agents to submit to. So it takes away all that work for you. And it's been constantly updated. Is there any other advice that you, you feel would be worth giving to a prospective author? Well, a couple of things is that you don't have to be published to be a writer. And I think that that's something to, you know, and it doesn't have to be a big five traditional deal. Um, if you write, you're a writer. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Also, it always goes back to the book. So if the book is not great, you know, you. I was talking to a colleague the other day and you look at these huge marketing campaigns by these, you know, Penguin or Hachette or whoever for these books loads of money pumped into them tube ads blog tours sponsored ads videos all of this and then the book comes out people read the book and then there's silence because the book hasn't captured people so if the book is not capturing people you know it all comes back to the book so you can pump as much as you want into a book and sometimes you know that might result in a, f a few hundred or even a few thousand sales but you want that book to be the best book it can be and it will always be readers that elect that lead that you know, you can only pump so much into marketing. You cannot force people to buy books, but never underestimate the power of, of recommendations. And, you know, don't ever underestimate book bloggers and book reviewers and small magazines. And don't ever underestimate the power of your personal mailing list. Like if you don't have... 150,000 followers on Twitter, that's absolutely fine. You might have 150 really good email contacts that are going to then tell three or four people each. And before you know, you've reached a thousand people. And if your book is good enough and capturing people, people will read that. And that's really good sales. You know, I just think that you, you have to be kind of innovative about it. And don't worry if you don't get picked up by a big agent or a big publisher. If the book is really good and you really believe in it, it will sell. One other thing is behave yourself. I've worked with authors that have been highly difficult to work with and really rude. And I would never work with them again. I would never recommend their books. Even if I quite like them, um, I wouldn't work with them. I wouldn't recommend their books. And if anyone came to me asking if I should work with them, I would be honest and say no, because you have to be nice in publishing. We love books. We love working with authors and you should be a part of a team. And so as soon as you 
um, as soon as you kind of disrespect that relationship or blame your lack of sales, you know, on a team that are small and working really hard for you and, you know, doing their absolute best, you kind of blacklist yourself. Publishing is not that big. So just behave yourself and be constructive in your criticism and don't throw your toys out the pram and don't come to a company for advice and then disregard it and do what you want you know I've worked with some really really challenging authors in the past um, who I would genuinely never ever work with again not for any money absolutely because it's all about the author brand at the end of the day isn't it if, if you've not got a, an, an honest brand behind you you're not going to be able to take it any further yeah, and even if your brand is just being really funny or really engaging or like as someone that, you know, I book a lot of guests for the festival and if someone, even if they've got a really good book, but they're not engaging or they're standoffish or rude, like, why would I book them? There are hundreds of authors out there. They might not have sold as many books as you or be an international bestseller, but they're much better to talk to. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, is there anything else which you feel it would be worth our authors knowing, either about Jericho itself or any particular advice or hints or tips that you've learned along the way? Oh, I think one thing that, um, well, I mean, firstly, I think anyone listening, just have a look at Jericho, have a little look at what we do. I'm relatively new to the company. I don't make anything from doing this, but I, working with them has been such a pleasure and they are so genuinely passionate about their books and you know subscribe to the newsletter get harry's friday newsletter you'll at least have a laugh and maybe learn something and i think i think the membership is 195 pounds a year i think which i think is pretty reasonable for what we're planning and it's just a really good step in taking yourself seriously as a as a writer and also we are so well connected between us you know Holly Seddon, best-selling author, is on our team. Do you know what I mean? She manages the community. You are so, you, your connect, our connections become your connections when you become a member. And I think that that's really key. You know, we will hold your hand and guide you at, at every level, basically, and always listen to you. But one thing I think as well, um, you know, when considering self-publishing is think of it as more than just you. Think of it as a, as a team and building a team around you. And pick and choose. There are so many resources out there. Pick and choose, you know. You can find amazing cover designers for so much cheaper than, you know, they would be in a traditional house. Um, the the self-published, I often see self-published covers, which never cease to amaze me. They are so bad. But the blurb sounds really good. And I think you can clearly write. Don't worry if you're not a designer. You know, get someone else to. And never try and tell the whole story with a cover. Don't try and tell the whole story with a title. You know, all of these things that, why would you know that? But also... Do your research. Oh, this is one thing that I always say, especially if you're self-publishing. Go into a bookshop, stand in the section where your book would sit. And that's one thing that's really important. You need to know where your book is going to sit in a bookshop. You know, if it's like, oh, it's a historical children's book about vampires, like that's fine. Go to the go to the children's section and see where that where that would be. Take out five books that have zombies or vampires or something, you know, uncanny or supernatural in them. Look at what the book's like. Your book needs to resemble that book because it needs to sit next to it on a shelf. If it looks completely different, people aren't gonna think, oh, that looks quirky. They're gonna think, oh, that looks rubbish. Like you have to follow trends to a certain extent. Um, you can still be individual in your ideas, but you do need to kind of tap into a market because it's it's a market. You've got to sell things. You know, if you wanna, if you wanna sell books, it has to sit, sit in the market. And another thing um, is always have perspective about what success is to you. So success might be finishing a novel, finishing a draft of a novel, or you might not feel like you're successful until you get picked up by a big five publisher, or you might not feel successful until you make an actual living from selling your own books on Amazon via KDP. Either way, set your goals, you know, your goals of success realistically and like give yourself a pat on the back for even, you know, even listening to this podcast because all of it is showing that you are um, investing in yourself as an author. And honestly, that's the first way to do it. Don't ever assume that you know everything. Not everyone knows everything about anything. That's why people like Jericho are here. So people like you guys are here. That's why editors exist. That's why courses exist. Editors get their work edited all the time. You know, we, you, no one in publishing houses sends out copy without five people looking at it like and that's their job you know don't don't put that so much pressure on yourself that you need to do everything all the time and don't rush it you know don't just finish the book and put it out there because it will not sell it will not work um also bear in mind like if you're writing quite niche short stories or literary fiction or something that is a difficult market anyway 
it probably won't sell well when it's self-published. So you just need to like have that as a realistic expectation of your success. Um, but if you're writing, you know, um, an eight book series, you know, a kind of Twilight-esque vampire love story thing, that's going to be much more likely to sell. Like, look at what's gone before and worked before and it works for a reason. Jericho writers run a range of courses covering creative writing and self-editing. They also offer manuscript assessment for all genres, plus an agent submission pack review. All details can be found at jerichowriters.com. Now, we love to close each podcast episode with a sample of one of our fabulous audiobooks. And in this episode, we're so excited to be able to play to you an audio sample of one of our best-selling books, Will It Make the Boat Go Faster? Written by Olympic gold medalist Ben Hunt Davis and popular keynote speaker, TED Talk presenter, coach and comic Harriet Beveridge, this audiobook has been voiced by the very talented voiceover artists Alexander Abeneri and Anne-Marie Piazza. The audiobook version of Will It Make the Boat Go Faster will be available soon on Amazon, Audible and iTunes. Introduction. Why buy this book? Whatever journey you were on, we sincerely hope these tried and tested strategies help your boat go faster. We first wrote Will It Make the Boat Go Faster to share Olympic winning strategies which anyone could apply to any walk of life to get their own gold medals. Since the first edition, we've been chuffed beyond measure to hear countless stories of how people have used the ideas, from the head teacher in a deprived area raising pupils' attainment, to the engineering company saving £50 million, from the lady who got back into running for the first time in decades, to the entrepreneurs who started their own businesses, the netball team who won their league, the police officer who secured promotion, and the leadership teams implementing compelling goals. How did it all come about? I first met Ben Hunt Davis when we joined the same company at the same time. I am ashamed to say I was annoyed that he joined. I really didn't see the relevance of him sitting down and paddling a bit faster than his competitors to me and my world, or our corporate clients. But the more I heard, the more fascinated I got. Ben told a compelling story about a pretty mediocre team in 1998 who transformed to become Olympic gold medalists two years later. And Ben wasn't a psycho either. Put aside the fact that he is a tad on the tall side and you'd never guess he was a sportsman, let alone a smarty pants Olympic gold medalist. I'd assumed that to be the best in the world, you'd have to be superhuman, arrogant, obsessive. To my delight, Ben proved to be a good laugh. He makes mistakes. He can be shy, lazy, an idiot, lose his temper... In other words, a pretty straightforward, normal guy. That piqued my interest. How could an ordinary person get extraordinary results? What secrets could I steal from his experiences to get more out of my life? Thanks to the tips in this book, I have mastered press-ups. I am not sporty. Taken three stand-up comedy shows to the Edinburgh Fringe, written a handful of books and, hopefully been a less than completely rubbish parent. Sorry I was such a sceptical prat when we first met Ben. How this book works. Each chapter is divided into two parts. Firstly, there is a narrative bit. This is where Ben recounts episodes on the eight's journey to gold. Ben has an uncanny knack for making you feel as if you were there in the boat with him, experiencing what it's like to be part of the Olympic team. Memory is a slippery eel, but we've done all we can to check that Ben has remembered things correctly. Secondly, there is a coaching bit. This is where I analyse how and why the crew did what they did. These sections are packed with step-by-step, practical advice and real-life examples. We've stuck to what the crew actually did, not what they ought to have done. It's a warts-and-all account, complete with questionable grammar. There are no theoretical musings here. It's all been road-tested. It's not an exhaustive description. 
Our aim with each topic is to pick out key points that make the biggest difference and are easy to transfer to different contexts. The chapters also unashamedly intertwine. Belief influence habits. Habits influence beliefs. Life is messy. And that's all for this episode. We'll see you in episode 8, where we'll be talking about the Writers and Artists Yearbook and editing. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Experience. Learn more about Indian self-publishing at our website, troubadour.co.uk.